Hey, somebody needs to wake up and smell the roses. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. The Professional Noticer is sponsored this week by our friends at Tucker ATV. You know, the sheer variety of power sport products at Tucker ATV will just, it, it's, it, it'll blow your mind. Hustler turf equipment, the entire line of Echo Power Tools, and of course, Tucker ATV carries every make and model of Polaris ATVs. They have the big Polaris side-by-sides, even bigger Ranger Crews. And you have to see the showroom. Taxidermy, antique displays, and an indoor porch with its port swing, comfortable chairs, television, and free coffee. Did I tell you it was free? Yeah, it's free. Stop in and meet Shannon and Lisa Tucker. They treat customers like family. Awesome, awesome people. You know, this is this is why they've done business with uh, people from 14 different states. At Tucker ATV this is highway. 43 North in Jackson, Alabama, Tucker ATV, the small town business with the national reputation. Observations and answers. That's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And as you know, we love it when somebody comes to the table with both observations and answers. And that's what we have here today. Now, I'm just going to introduce him and then I'll just tell you about him as we go along. Please welcome Dr. Mark Foley. Andy, it's good to be with you, man. This is cool. Buddy, I am so glad you're here. Those of you who uh, subscribe to Wisdom Harbor, which if you don't, uh, press pause and do it now. But uh, for those of you who subscribe to Wisdom Harbor, uh, Dr. Mark is a contributor on Wisdom Harbor. In fact, your your thing about the treasure, the Americans' hidden treasures, just the other day was fast. That was fun to do. I mean, you always teach me something when I... <laughs> When I do one of those things for you, I, I you end up saying, "I bet you didn't know," and I really didn't know that. Didn't know so that, I learned. Yeah. Now you you are the president emeritus of the University of Mobile, right? Yeah, that means I lived through it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that means you were president a long time, and you're still alive. And I enjoyed being a pre- college president. It was uh, one of the great um, and meaningful experiences of my life. Went 18 years in that role. Wow. And then I, I realized one day it was time to pass it off to the next guy. You, you know, you and Nick Saban. Um, yeah, sure. We're a lot alike. <laughs> <laughs> but I suspect that Coach Saban had the same experience I did. You do this, this you're entrusted with a, with a job, entrusted with an organization, in this case, an independent college called the University of Mobile, a very special place. By the way, I'm going to brag on the university just a minute. Okay. What my the current president, Lonnie Burnett, good friend of mine, uh, and and the nursing faculty have experienced an almost heard of thing. One hundred percent of the nursing students at the University of Mobile passed their qualifying exam to become nurses. That is almost unheard of. That shoved the University of Mobile to the top of the heap in that field. I'm very proud of them. Wow, that is very cool. Yeah. So it was fun to do that for a long time. But a day came when I knew that there was a a certain effort that needed to be made to yet invent, reinvent another part of the university. And I realized I didn't want to do it. For the first time, I didn't want to do it. And I knew that that was the moment I needed to inform the board. We need to go look for the next guy. And, And we did successfully. Wow. And, you know, people, here, here's something people ask me a lot. <clears throat> they say, uh, you coach people, you help people. So who, who coaches you? And the answer is right here, Dr. Marks. <laughs> Dr. Marks is my coach. It, just for several years, we've been meeting every Monday. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to tell you something. When I... I first met you. You, you really aggravated me. Uh, Great. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the reason the reason is because I mean you see you, you got to see the the photographs behind me. I take all those, and you know, I thought it was pretty good. I mean, I knew I wasn't a photographer. I just had good equipment, but still, I was producing some 
pretty good stuff. You do. You and, do. Oh, shut up. And I oh. think, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm pretty good. Then Mark comes in and he shows me some of his stuff. And I'm like, I quit. I, I quit. I mean, your stuff is so good. I mean, it, it's it's just, I, I mean, if you think that's good, that's just like goes into the garbage after the show. I mean, compared to Mark's. And hopefully we can show some of these yeah. things. Well, I, listen, before you, you go too much down that path, I'm sitting here looking at, and I'm sure the, the Osprey I'm looking at will find its way on the screen as I speak of it. That is a fabulous photograph. How cool is it that we get to go out in the wild, sit by ourselves in a, in a place when nobody else is around, and sometimes for hours waiting for something to happen, and something like that impressive, giant predator osprey flies by and you capture that. It's just, uh, it's cool stuff. It, it's great. And you know, both of, both of us are hunters, and yet... Both of us, we we take way more pictures than than we pull triggers, you know. <laughs> and everybody goes home happy at the end of the everybody day. Everybody goes happy. happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I took that one of the Archangel Gabriel, actually. I wanted to talk to you about that. I'm sure that too will be on the screen as I speak. This. Why does the Archangel Gabriel look like you? You know, I have no idea. I have no idea. And why does David Plunder look like Bradley Cooper? No, just turn and get a profile and let 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 the folks look at your profile and Gabriel and tell me. Yeah, okay. Came out of your shop, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, you know, we, we actually just kind of put words in AI. And Isn't said, that amazing? Yeah, it's kind of freaky. Yeah. Kind of freaky. What is, I, I know, I mean, you have a, a bald eagle that is just taking off that I think is just unbelievable. You have a hummingbird that just like makes me want to quit taking pictures forever. And you have a um, a white heron. Egret, yeah. An egret. Big white egret, with yeah. The, with the, the, the water mirroring. Yeah. You know, those moments happen every now and then. That eagle was fun. He was sitting on a post. I've been watching him for an hour. I'm a bit of a nerd on that. You know, I'll just sit and wait. And well, that's what he, and he was he was up there and he and I knew eventually he was gonna move. And about the time he started to turn, he got buzzed by what has to be the dumbest seagull on the face of the earth. Who buzzes an eagle? An eagle, yeah. But this one did, and it aggravated the eagle, and I caught the look. <laughs> <laughs> that it was just so much fun. It is, yeah. And what you what you do? Tell it. Tell me what's behind. What's mentally behind your photographs? Because yours, you've taught me so much about doing this, but you've taught me a lot about the thought process too. I think part of it. I will. Con I'll. I'll. I'll um express great gratitude for my mother, who's still living at 102, and until just recently, because her eyesight began to, to bother her, she stopped painting. She was a, a watercolor artist. Now, I can't make anything happen on a, on a piece of paper or a palette. That's just not my skill, but I think I got her eye. The ability to see and to understand color, not, I'm not trained in it. It's just one of those things you know when you see it, and, right. and it's... Um, it, and it lends itself to what we do with the camera. So the camera is our is our brush, and all of nature is our palette. So we get to to look. But I I, I find that the uh, as I have grown in this in the ability, and as equipment has improved, um, to look for the eyes of a creature. And with some of our equipment, as you know, we can we can do that. We can get to the focus on the eye if we're good enough and still enough and patient enough to wait for it. Right. And that means dressing up like a bush and being still for hours on end. But you can <laughs> you can get to that point and you see the eye of that creature. Um and the and the life is in that in that moment. And you catch it. You just catch it with a with a burst of images. Yeah, there is a there's a photograph you have of 
a bison in snow. Yeah, yeah. And that eye on that bison. It was a magical day. Sitting him, that eye kind of rolled back. Yeah. <sighs> that was, uh, there's, uh, there's a wonderful place called the Arsenal Wildlife Preserve just west of Denver, literally on the edge of Denver. But when you enter the preserve, you're out on the prairie, and it's a five-mile drive around it. On this particular day, it had snowed and just stopped snowing when we entered the preserve, and a herd of bison were just right there beside the road. Uh, it was it was magical. It's something that I've not I've gone back many times, not had it repeat. You know, I, I have a, a pretty stupid story about bison. Uh, <laughs> Austin and I had gone. <laughs> Out to uh, the Custer Wildlife Refuge out in the Black Hills. And and so we were going to drive through this wildlife refuge, and we had a rental car. And we had gone through a lot of snow and ice. And and so we're it's midday, wintertime, and nobody's there. I mean, we were at the, at the, um, the Black Hills Monument, and there was like five people there. It Amazing. was crazy. Yeah. And so as we're driving through this Custer Wildlife Refuge, we come over a hill and and Austin goes, There they are. There they are. And there's about fifty buffalo bison. Yeah. And they're just kind of crammed up on a hill. Well, as we start slowly going down the hill, they perked up, they saw us, and they started coming to us. They're they're like coming to us, and then so then we stopped, and then they started running. I mean, they're running to us, and they get and and we're thinking they face and they hit the car, and they screech to a halt like right there at the car, and they surround the car, and and they're doing something, and I I said what are they doing? And Austin said they're licking the car. <laughs> and and the, the windows and everything, and they're licking the salt. the salt. Salt on the car, yeah. Is that not an impressive moment when a two-ton buffalo, bull buffalo licks moves? your salt? Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, the picture you're referring to, I was, I had him in and I was taking several shots and he was getting closer and closer and closer. I'm inside my truck uh, hanging out the window and this guy is getting closer and closer. I mean, we're talking about a two ton monster of a beast. Yeah. The hump being a little over six feet to its top and the head is massive. Right. And it's just right there. And, and that's, that's what we get to do with a camera. Cool stuff. What is your favorite one that you've ever taken? Well, the buffalo's up there, but I, I think my favorite was the first time I caught a large white egret in the moment of capture and catching a fish. And That's right. He went down and came up, and he had literally speared a, a little brim with his beak. And the wind was behind him, blowing his feathers up. It was just a moment, and I've it's and I've since caught many with a in a moment of catch, but none none quite like that. I think that's the first one that I saw. I think that's when, yeah. When I was showing, I made a point of showing it to you. Yeah, I know. I I was like, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you go. Do you take these? Yeah, I do. All right. Yeah, I, I take all these. And you said, oh, here's one I took last week, and I looked at it and went. Really? Okay, I quit. I mean, we'll, we'll put that on the screen for everybody. That's just it. It was a it was a cool moment. All right, let me ask you: What do you think about when you're pointing a camera at one of these? You've got some. Your your style is different from mine. There's uh, a scale, a a picture of a fish, side of a fish. Is that a red fish? That's a red snapper. Red snapper. Yeah. The scale, the geometry of of the scales behind you is a field of sunflowers. Yeah, the ge the just there's a magnificence to that. And then there's the angel. I don't know how you managed that picture. I had to sneak up on him. <clears throat> yeah, and and when I when I got close, I thought, should I? Should I not? And he turned around and said, fear not. And so I, I went ahead. 
Well, let's move past the angel and come back to that. But what were you thinking when you? The, let me pick one. Okay, here's one with your son holding a shark. That's impressive. But the owls, the owls of uh, which I, I I still have I've yet to get my first really good shot of an owl. But what yeah. were you thinking when, when you I was shooting saw those them? owls? What I was thinking, I was thinking, I'm I'm watching there. I'm going zooming in there. Mark Felly's not not ever taken a picture like this. Mark Felly had never gotten an owl. That's what I was thinking. Okay, fair enough. So, Mark, you you are one of Mobile's most visible leaders. I would say there with Sandy Stimson, the mayor. We've had Sandy on the podcast, mm -hmm. and and right now, and and. And while you are one of Mobile's most visible leaders, you're not elected to anything. You're not. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't guess you. You have a title, and yet so many people turn to you. And and right now, one of the things you guys have going on is Shalom Mobile. So explain that. Tell me what that is, and tell me how that came about. Can I give you a little background first? Please. Because it, it's it's an evolution of thought to Shalom Mobile. Um, when I when I became a college president, I thought, okay, what what, what are we doing here? What's our purpose? Uh, the University of Mobile is a faith based school, and and so the working out of one's faith and linking it professionally really became important to me. And so the idea of influence, a professional with spiritual influence in the workplace became important to me. And that's what we tried to, to bring to the table with our students through their experience at the university. When I retired, I, um, I was encouraged by a friend to start a consulting company and basically said, look, you can, you can dance on that stage anywhere you need to. But as and so we did and started that and and but as time went by the same focus began began to emerge with the consulting company as I was trying to inf that I was trying to influence uh, college students and that is how do you how do you use your influence in appropriate and effective ways to create change in in an, in an important environment. And I was doing that as a professional, not as a minister, but as a as a professional, and in this case, a business owner, as a right. consulting company, um, among business leaders who are uh, individuals of faith, part of the criteria that I use in, in the engagement, an individual of faith who wants to understand how to marry his or her faith with their business. So I'm talking to CEOs and business owners in that. And in, over time, that has grown. And then as, as, as the, the idea of, it, of scaling that beyond what happens between uh, two professionals in a consulting engagement, as, as with you and I, the, a coach to a CEO, and we talk about spiritual content as well as business, hopefully with, a, with the end effect that your business is reflecting the kind of values and growth that you hope it does. And in thinking then, how do we scale it? How do we move that to a little bit larger stage? And the idea began to evolve in a conversation with other friends about that question, how do we, how do we make more of a difference than we are? And Shalom Mobile began to grow out of that. So the idea of, of, in this case, in the case of Shalom Mobile, how do you pray for good government around us? How do we address God? Does God care about good government? It certainly does. Um, God is the author of government. So then good government has certain qualifications. It is effective for one thing, for another, it honors the things of God. So Shalom Mobile is a project that is designed to invite other people into a praying core of individuals um, 
for the purpose of asking God to bring good government among us. Now, we don't do this wholesale because it's so, you start talking about how do you change a nation, how do you change a state, it's a little overwhelming. So we focus on our region, the greater Mobile area. How do we find and pray for good government in the Mobile area? And so we pray for government leaders. We pray for the challenges that they face. We uh, ask God to bring blessing to them. And we follow a particular model. And it's the model that's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Now, to remind our, our audience of what that says, God is speaking to a government official. Uh, in this case, a young king named Solomon. And he predicted that the people might get a little squirrely. And he said, when that happens, Solomon, if my people, those people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will restore the land. That creates a model, a model that um, I believe is available to any of us who are God followers, confessors of, of Christ and the followers, the, the Christian mindset. If we will meet these, this criteria, these four points, and God said he would do three things, hear, forgive, and restore. Now, in that day with Solomon, restoring the land, I'm sure, I'm quite sure, meant returning its fertility so it would grow the crops and the wheat and stimulate the economy for the people Israel in that time. Now, uh, it's a bit speculative as what restoring the land means, but I, while I don't know exactly what it is, I know it's good. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to see more of it. So our focus is not on trying to convince God of something he already said he would do. Our focus is to go to those four qualifications, the expectations of God, and look to how we fulfill those four qualifications of say, humbling say, self. <clears throat> say that again. Say that again. All right. We're not trying to talk God into doing something he's already promised to do. Right. So it's not like we're praying, oh, God, do this. God, do this. Please do this. We're looking at God's instructions to us about what to do exactly. when everything hits the fan. That's right. Or on a daily basis before it hits the fan. Right, right. What are those four things? And I, I believe they establish basically a, a position, for a believer's position. Humbling myself, um, prayer, which I believe is lingering in the, in the presence of God, seeking God on a personal and individual basis, very intentional, and then turning from sin, agreeing with God that something needs correcting my life and taking care of that so that I'm in this positional mode all the time and praying from position, at which point God said he would hear, forgive, and restore. Now, I believe that applies to government. Now, there's a reason why government's the focus here. Is there any part of your life that government doesn't touch one way or another? Unfortunately, no. Yeah, it's pervasive. I mean, from birth to death, government's involved. Now, you're talking about statutes on, on the national level, state, but here we're talking about locally. What, what about a city government? And the entities and agencies related to city government, they touch our lives every day. From, from the traffic light on the way home to, uh, to the office of the mayor, the government is at work. So what if we started asking God for good government? Not to imply it's not, but it can always be better. What does good government look like? And what if God were to hear our prayers from position and begin to restore and do some special things in a community that we might say are good government? And then how does government then, used by God, with or without consent, <laughs> to begin to create essential changes in areas that we just haven't seemed to find a handle on. So that's what Shalom Mobile is about. And right now, there are almost 300 people praying every day for good government in Mobile. Where did the name come from? Uh, Mobile? Well, that was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shalom. Um, Shalom is a, uh, was recommended by one of our one of our core group members who is uh, Jewish in background. And he said, Shalom's a, mean, a, a word that we're understood means peace, and it does. But it also means completeness and wholeness. 
Um, it means healing. It means it, it's it's an all encompassing word that means at the end of the day restoration, a restored person, a restored place, a restored community. So it stuck. Shalom Mobile. You know, I think an interesting thing about that verse that I think people miss, because we always look, you know, we look at the state of the world and the state of our cities and our states, and we go, man, if these people would just, gosh, if, you know, well, what are we going to do about these people? And these people are doing this, and these people, and if we didn't have these people, and, you know, the verse says, if my people who are called by my name. Right. That's that's his name, Christ, Christians. If my people would, so he didn't say anything about them. It's us. Yeah. Well, we're the ones who can change. We're the ones. And that's and that's the point. When you start looking at that verse, it's it's criteria and it's promise. It's amazing because as now I'm I have responsibility for playing in position. Like any like any athlete does. And we're seeing a lot of football right now and in the play NFL playoffs, college playoffs. Um and you mentioned Coach Saban a while ago. Can you can you imagine a game with Coach Saban on the sidelines when he saw a player not playing his position that he was quiet about it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's not quiet about it. Play your position. I remember my my football career was long ago and brief and ugly, but uh, I do remember learning the lesson of position. I played. Uh, this was in the '60s. If I was the left defensive end. And so my job, as far as I knew, was to keep the runner from running outside of me, to contain. Uh, we faced a team, the Hershey Huskies, across town rivals. Um, and for the first time in my life, I, I saw what is now known as pro T set. We were, t we were coached in the single wing. So run was all that was done. But all of a sudden, here's the quarterback right behind the center, and I thought, how odd is that? And the quarterback took the snap, spun around, and kept the ball and ran to his left right toward me. And I thought, how odd. <laughs> He's running at me as if he expects me to somehow fall down. Now, before the play was snapped, there was another odd thing. Another, a young man, small young man, ran out to the sideline. I've since known him as a wide receiver. I'd never seen a wide receiver. We're not coached in wide receivers. But I figured if that young man wanted to run out there and play all by himself, that I didn't need to bother with him because he didn't have the ball. How odd for him to do that. And so now the ball carrier's coming right at me as if I'm just going to magically fall down. And just as I was about to spring in what I'm sure would have been one of the finest tackles in all of the annals of high school football in Texas. I caught a little flash of bright blue out of my corner of my eye, the color of the Hershey Huskies jerseys. And the instant later, I was on my back, and that little fellow who had been out there by himself was on top of me, and the ball carrier was scampering unhindered <laughs> down the field. And I thought, how odd is this? So I got up and helped the young man up because I, I wanted to make sure he was all right, that he had not become injured in taking me completely out of the play and <laughs> helped him dust off. I might have encouraged him with a word or two and sent him on his way, but I made note of that. And every time we lined up, when that young man would trot out, I would watch him. Though I didn't consider it part of my position, I was now watching him. And as I watched him, the ball was snapped he would run down the field. Apparently, I had frightened him with my words of encouragement. <laughs> and and the ball carrier, but late in the late in the game, once again, the ball carrier spun, kept the ball coming toward me. The young man had run out, but I didn't look at him because he had not come toward me the rest of the game. And once again, I'm prepared to make this great play. And once again, I caught a glimpse of blue out of the corner of my eye, and once again, I was flat on my back. The importance of learning your position. 
the importance of playing the position. Any coach will tell you. How many times have I asked you, are you in position? Right. And the position I'm talking about in life is that I've humbled myself. I'm praying. I'm lingering in the presence of God. I'm seeking his, his will intently, and I'm agreeing with him about things that need correcting in my life. And I do that as a pattern, playing position. And here's my contention. When I'm playing position, my antenna is going to be up. I will be aware of things like the young man out there in the blue jersey who was taking me out of the play. I'm prepared, and I am more effective as a player. I think that's the way a Christian life can be lived. And God has already said, if Foley, if you'll do that, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, and I'll restore the land. Now, God's restoration, man, can you imagine how marvelous that will be? And so we're praying for the Mobile region, 300 of us, praying every day for God's restoration, praying from position that he will do something special in that city. Now, it's not, 300 is not a magic number. Actually, we're just a little under 300 right now, but growing. It will soon be 300 and more. So to the audience today, listen, if you, you're you going to see a, oh, hey, an address on your site, I want you to go to that address, take a listen, and come join us. Be a part of something very special. And if you're not a resident of Mobile, just shift your prayer attention to the government where you are. You know, one of the, <clears throat> one of the things I want everybody to know is uh, before we go, is that if you if you are loving Dr. Mark like we all do, <clears throat> there is a thing called the journey. Yeah. And so we'll put on the show notes how to connect with Shalom Mobile, how to connect with the journey. But the journey will come into your email or your text email at yeah. at six a.m. Central Time every day. Every day, and it takes about sixty seconds to read it. And it is over and over again the most impactful part of my day. <clears throat> and, and so it costs nothing to get on that mailing list. And it's it, it's quick and it's it's just awesome. I've I've turned a lot of people on to that, but I would love it if this audience would, would join that. And so thank you. Yeah. For Can I tell you where the journey came from? Yeah. It's, it's cool. You know, it's 10 years now, 10 years. That I've never done anything for 10 years in my life. But every morning at about 5 o'clock, I get up and I write something that will be posted the next day. That's been happening for 10 years. But what I write is um, a summary of my conversation with the Lord that day. Now, sometimes it's camouflaged a little bit because it gets— when we too revealing, self-revealing. But anyway, that's that's what gets posted. It's it's part of my conversation. It's my journey instruction. Yeah. But and, what and a, I read it as what God's saying to me for the upcoming day. Yeah, and that amazes me. I just I take such amazement and such um so grat gratified that it that it has that that effect. But basically it's God's instruction to me. And he's usually working in one of those areas of of position. Right. Quite often the part where I need to correct something. <laughs> right. And he wants to adjust it. Well, it's great. I, I hope you guys will join. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. I really Glad appreciate this. I, I get, I'm excited to get to show you off to huh. everybody. Okay. And, and, um, and by the way, it's and uh, to humbly, to humble myself yeah. in my photography efforts. Well, here's the good news. It's, January, mid-January, and cold, and there's not much to take pictures of right now, but in about a month, the osprey will start building their nests again. Yeah. And we'll yeah. have another shot at one of these magnificent animals. Here we go. Isn't that fun? Thank you, buddy. Yeah, man. Thank you. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. 
seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Till next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Shetland Ponies for the cast and crew provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by The Cartoon Christmas Story. In an effort to reach more children, the makers of The Chosen have adapted cartoon characters to the most loved tale of the first Christmas portrayed in Luke chapter 2. In this version, Fred and Wilma Flintstone play the parts of Mary and Joseph, while Scooby-Doo acts as the donkey Mary rode that night. The part of the innkeeper with no room is carried by Elmer Fudd, and the angel Gabriel is admirably played by Foghorn Leghorn. Boy, I say boy, fear not. The three wise men are beautifully done by Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and Porky Pig, who upon seeing baby Jesus proclaims a, a, a gift for the for the new king. We, we bring you Frank, Frank, uh, Mer, uh, Frank, Frank uh, Gold. Huckleberry Hound, Snagglepuss, Wile E. Coyote, Yosemite Sam, and the Jetson family round out the cast playing the part of the shepherds, watching or their flocks by night. And the star of the show, of course, is Baby Jesus, played by the child star from the Flintstones, Bam Bam. The way in a manger. Bam, 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 from the makers of The Chosen. That's the cartoon Christmas story. Streaming now on Netflix and Amazon Prime.